Okay, hey everybody, it's uh, Rob Daywalt with another uh, short video lecture. Wanted to say welcome to you in our property class that we're going to be meeting on together. Uh, this is a new semester, so I hope you're getting around okay and that you can deal with this new uh, process called Vital Source, which is your systematic way of obtaining your lessons through your book. Uh, and so uh, if you have difficulty with that, I'm, I'm actually struggling with it a little myself. We'll learn about this new technology together, but it should be very helpful in the long run and uh, affordable on your part. So this is property, like I said. If you need to get a hold of me, uh, one option is my uh, private email, which is robdaywaltatme.com. You can always send me a note on an email and ask me, if you have any questions, if you're having some personal problems, you want to talk on the phone, uh, anything like that will be fine and I'll be glad to get right back with you. I try to respond to all my emails within uh, a couple hours. Uh, so uh, sometime during the day if I'm not teaching or doing something else, I will get back to you and uh, respond to any questions that you have. Like I said, welcome, want you to post. In your discussion board, post something about your um, uh, self, I mean your kids, your family, your husband, significant other, uh, dogs, cats, uh, prior life, uh, work experience, uh, future plans, what's your goals, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, kind of an icebreaker to get to know each other. Then the other thing is we're going to have an assignment today about bailments. And I'm going to talk to you about a really interesting thing here. I'm probably pretty sure that you don't know anything about bailment. So uh, I've got a case we're going to go through together. I'm going to want you to find that case and brief that case. Or if you can't find that case, find some case on uh, bailment. So we're going to work on bailments today. Uh, this is part of the section on personal property. It is not covered in your book at all, okay? Your book is primarily about real estate. Uh, most of the work we're going to do in your book is going to be chapters about different aspects of buying and selling real estate or inheriting real estate or problems with real estate, uh, agreements made in real estate that maybe are fraudulent, you know, a number of different things over the course of the semester. But uh, in my property class, when I took this many, many years ago, I had never heard of the notion of a bailment. And a bailment generally is where a person or a company takes responsibility for another person's property. In other words, they take possession of it. You take your shirts to the laundry uh, or your fur coat and you expect to get your fur coat or your shirts back in at least as good a condition as they were when you dropped them off. You don't expect to get the, the thing back. It's torn, it's stained, uh, buttons are broken off. In other words, so a bailment means that while they're holding your property, it will not be uh, harmed in any way. Now, uh, you go into a parking garage, you park your car, Somebody comes up, scratches your car, breaks in your car, steals your radio. Uh, who's responsible for that? Well, a lot of times you'll get like a slip from the parking company. You flip it over, read the back, it says this is not a bailment. Well, it may or may not be uh, a bailment. And so this case that we're going to be looking at about bailments is uh, kind of interesting and it kind of will further our understanding of this notion of personal property. So personal property is anything that's mine that's basically portable, like my car, my watch, uh, you know, uh, radio, telephone, you know, my cell phone, something like that uh, would be uh, personal property. Now, uh, real property is like my house, okay? Uh, or my farm or anything like that. So it's ground, it's something attached to the ground like a house that's attached to the ground. So these are the differences here. So let's jump into this. It's really kind of funny and interesting but this case I found is in the Indiana Court of Appeals and uh, one of the attorneys, the attorney for the appellee, 
which was the plaintiff in the case below, is a guy named David Porter Murphy, who is a good friend of mine, and he teaches here at Ivy Tech uh, along with me, and you may yet have him in a class. So it's really fascinating that we found uh, this case of David's. It's out of uh, Greenfield, which is where he practices, and it involves the Kroger Company and a lady named Patricia Hammond. So it's Kroger Company versus Patricia Hammond. There's another lawyer named Jeffrey Zipes who represented the Kroger Company. So in this decision, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, and uh, so it's got a case summary with it. And what it basically is at this stage, Kroger is appealing this case where Patricia sued Kroger's uh, for $570.00. Uh, and so it basically, uh, you know, uh, tries to argue that the ruling by the court was contrary to law because uh, what they're trying to say is that there is no bailment between Kroger's and Mrs. Hammond. So uh, because they couldn't find anything in error in the case, they affirmed the decision, meaning that Kroger is going to owe Mrs. Hammond $570. So the facts and history of this are uh, that uh, Mrs. Hammond was an in-home health care uh, service person who did shopping for elderly or disabled clients. And in 2006, in December, right after Christmas, she was shopping at the Kroger store. She put her purse, which contained an organizer, which had a lot of client names, list, money, in her cart. Uh, when she checked out, uh, the bank clerk brought in another cart and put it in the lane and then moved her cart to the other side of the lane behind some boxes. And he thought, uh, Mrs. Hammond thought, that the Kroger employee had put everything, including her purse, in this other cart. Well, as she's leaving the store, she realizes she doesn't have her purse. She hurries back. It's just a matter of minutes. Told the cashier that her purse was not there. Uh, the clerk said, you know, they looked all over for it and they couldn't find it. Uh, basically, someone, of course, turned in the purse, but the money was missing, which was money that belonged to all of her clients. So she had a substantial amount of money with her to buy groceries for several different elderly people and it was seven or five hundred and seventy dollars so uh, she filed suit against Kroger's because Kroger said they didn't owe her uh, and uh, basically uh, basically all that the Kroger people could do is give her her wallet there was no money there's no real indication that the employee stole the money so that's why we come in to bailment. If she had direct evidence that the employee stole the money, that would be a different kind of a case. That would be a master-servant tort case involving, um, you know, basically conversion of property as a civil name for theft in the criminal law. So basically what happened here was she's trying to assert that Kroger's owed her a duty to watch out for her stuff to make sure nobody steals it when there's a misunderstanding like this. Uh, so basically, uh, it's very clear in the record of the case that there's no evidence that the Kroger employee stole the money. But what they're saying is that the Kroger employee mishandled her purse and the money uh, by not putting it in a safe place. And that because of the bailment laws, which go way back in time to the early years of the English common law, uh, this concept of bailment still applies in our modern times uh, in these commercial transactions. So what they're saying here is that uh, uh, this is uh, small claims, it's only $570, it's a real informal process, uh, but there has to be some pretty strong evidence that says that the court made a bad decision. Uh, there's other cases out there. Mayflower versus Davenport, 714 Northeast 2nd, 794, a 1999 case. The burden of proof is uh, uh, on the plaintiff. If the plaintiff 
uh, provide sufficient evidence that there was a reasonable trier fact could follow and decide in their favor, then in that case, uh, basically, uh, they win by what we call a preponderance of the evidence. And that's what they're saying happened here in this, in this case. So what I would recommend that you do is find this uh, bailment case, and this can be your first assignment for me, and that is to brief this case, Kroger versus Patricia Hammond. The case number is the appellate court case number, which is 30A010705 CV 2009, and it is a 2007 decision. The judge that made the decision is Judge Robb, who wrote the opinion for the rest of the court. Uh, and so look it up. It basically goes through a number of older cases on uh, bailments. Uh, another good case, Pittman versus Pittman, uh, 717 Northeast 2nd, 627, which says that a bailment arises when personal property belonging to one person, the bailor, delivers the property uh, into the exclusive possession of the bailee uh, and the property is accepted by the bailey. And so basically what they're saying is that it's a pretty plain, simple statement. Now if that's true, that when you hang your coat in a restaurant, then regardless, uh, they're basically saying, uh, you know, you give it to them and they accept it, then they are duty bound to protect it. Now a lot of them have these slips that they give you or a sign. I know that a sign will not work. Uh, it's a good question about whether if they give you a receipt that says this is not a bailment or we are not accepting your property, uh, that may be more effective where they've actually given you individually a document that says we are not accepting your property. Uh, you can hang your coat here, but we're not accepting responsibility for your coat. Uh, same way, you know, what about security in a parking garage? Do they have a duty? to make sure some kid doesn't get in there and break into your car and steal your stereo? Uh, do they have that much of a duty as far as security? Well, you can carry that further. I mean, do they have a duty to make sure you don't get raped in the parking garage? I mean, you know, so these are all kinds of things that kind of are implicated when we look at this bailment situation. So this boils down to what we call constructive bailment, okay? so. I'm going to put this out here. I hope you can see it. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is constructive bailment. And what it's basically constructive means implied, implied bailment. What they're saying is if there's no proof that it's not a bailment, then it is a bailment. So that's an important fact to know. So these bailments, it's where you own the property, you give it to someone else, uh, to take care of for you, uh, and they do a bad job of taking care of it, they lose it, it's stolen, it's broken, uh, whatever. So I want you to work a little bit on bailments this week, uh, get that to me, uh, you should get it to me before Sunday. There's a number of other cases, I didn't go into much depth here, uh, please look through it yourself. Uh, and if you're in uh, David Porter Murphy's class, uh, ask him about it. Maybe he can give you even more information on it. Thanks for watching. Again, feel free to contact me if you have any questions or problems. Thanks again. Bye now.